Hello and welcome to the India Hangout. Uh, will PSU disinvestments go forth in the manner that they've been planned? Will they raise anywhere between 30 to 60 or 70,000 crores? And more so and more importantly, what will this achieve? And if so, how will this be done? I'm joined to discuss this by Subir Gokan, Director of Research at Brookings, Jay Narayan Vyas, politician and former Gujarat Cabinet Minister, Prithvi Haldia of Prime Database. The question we are asking is, can the PSU disinvestment or divestment be taken forth in the manner that it should be? And if so, how should it be done? And what are the lessons from the past, if so? Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in this business standard exclusive discussion that we're doing today. Subir, let me uh, begin with you. What are the key strategies that, uh, or the strategy that should be followed if the whole process of disinvestment were to be rolled forward as it has been uh, talked about, particularly in the last few weeks? Well, I think uh, there is a, a generic strategy that needs to be followed. Uh, and uh, this has been something that was talked about uh, many years ago when disinvestment was actually being seen as a, a legitimate long-term uh, resource mobilization exercise by the government. But it has been a very spotty uh, you know, uh, process. Uh, we had a few years when uh, assets, significant assets were sold, uh, but by and large over the last 10 years it's been relatively small in terms of the amount of money that was raised. But I think the four, we need to divide up PSUs into let's say four categories. Uh, maybe three, maybe five, but just for illustration let me say four. The first is, you know, what we've been talking about as uh, Navaratnas or, you know, the, the, the sort of prime uh, assets, the blue chips, uh, which are very sound, solid going concerns because of the market environment they operate in, because of the products they produce, the service they produce. And those essentially uh, have value as going concerns and you need to be able to realize that value uh, through the stock market. That's the obvious route. And that's essentially how we went about it uh, you know, in, in, in past uh, episodes. Uh, the second l lot are in uh, you should say uh, companies that have value as going concerns uh, because they're in, in kinds of businesses that uh, that offer uh, you know reasonably good value propositions for stakeholders I I you know offhand I can't think of an example I'm just creating the categories sure. uh, and these need to be sort of taken to a point where uh, the market finds them acceptable uh, and uh, I think there is a sort of uh, a strategic uh, direction and a strategic effort that needs to be made to get these companies. The third category, I think, are companies that essentially uh, are not very valuable as going concerns, that, uh, you know, companies that are better off or more valuable to the government uh, as uh, just bundles of assets, not as, not as uh, going concerns. And these need to be uh, broken up into the best possible uh, disaggregation of assets, whether it's real estate, whether it's land, whether it's other rights, uh, and these assets sold off. Uh, and the fourth category, I suppose, uh, the residual category, are companies that really don't have very much value, who have not hired people for the last 20, 25 years, uh, whose workforces have essentially, you know, all retired, and all you have is a pension liability and, so, and a bunch of relatively low-value assets. And these just need to be shut down. The liability has to be, uh, the pension liability has to be absorbed by, by the government onto its budget or in some other way. And these companies just shut down. So where the value is going to be realized, I think, is in the first three categories. You have uh, a, a direct sort of market offering kind of strategy in the first category. Uh, you have a development, a sort of mentoring, and then to then a uh, IPO or, or uh, FPO uh, in the second category. And third is uh, asset sales, uh, whatever they are. Now, we, we have something like 250, if I remember right, uh, public enterprises. And I'm sure there will be uh, you know, a fairly large number in each of these categories. Uh, and it's really up to the disinvestment uh, ministry or whoever is administering this process right. to, uh, to the ministry anymore as part of the Ministry of Finance now with the Department of Disinvestment to work through this process of you know, deciding which uh, enterprise falls into which category and getting the maximum value. I think the objective should be value maximization, how much money okay. can the government realize as quickly as possible and uh, basically uh, you know, do what, it, what is necessary to, to realize that value. 
Right. Okay. Uh, let's get. A, I'm. I'm going to come to Prithvi Haldia in a second. Uh, uh, Mr. Vyas, uh, uh, good evening to you too. Uh, you know, th there are obviously many examples from the state of Gujarat, and they've all been discussed in some detail in the past. Uh, companies like uh, Gujarat State Fertilizer Corporation, Alkalis, Gujarat Electricity Board, Gujarat Narmada uh, uh, Fertilizers Corporation. Now, all of these are cases of instances of companies uh, which were state-run, not doing very well, but brought into profitability and uh, some measure of uh, financial stability. What are the, uh, like, let's say, the headline lessons that one can take away from uh, how these companies have been turned around, and then we'll come to whether it can be replicate, replicated elsewhere. Right. Okay. I think we have a problem uh, with Mr. Vyas's connection. Uh, uh, Mr. Haldia, let me come to you uh, and let me flip the same question that I asked uh, Subir earlier. If you were to look at it from a primary market uh, absorption and capacity uh, and uh, and uh, capacity and uh, capability point of view, what is the what is the sort of appetite that you see at this point, and how can this be best managed uh, given the condition of the overall secondary and then primary markets? Before coming to the primary market, you know, um, I agree with Subir's nationally in terms of categorization of the various primary However, uh, my categorization would be slightly different in the sense that there are PSUs which are listed. If you look at them, because there is enough, uh, you know, disclosure, they have gone through public scrutiny, uh, there is interest of the investors in those companies. And I think uh, there should be an immediate attempt of the government, uh, given the market conditions in the mode of the economy. Get, uh, to 25% public shareholding at the earliest, and then even target at a 49% public shareholding going forward in the next couple of years. These are all, as uh, we know, are Maharatnas and they are very good companies and there is enough appetite for these companies going forward. The second is uh, the uh, profitable companies of, in the PSC which are, um, uh, which are yet not listed and I think we should look at uh, an early IPO for these companies, whether it is the RIM or the or any other companies. And we should have a strategy of doing an IPO, an IPO for these companies that we are doing. The third is uh, to look at uh, you know companies which are uh, non-strategic and loss-making. I think the government should take a call instantly to you know uh, to find a strategic way out to sell these assets uh, through a very transparent uh, method. Uh, there is no need to for the government a to uh, be in those sectors and b to continuously support them uh, through budgetary uh, allocations uh, because they are loss making. And therefore, I think non-strategic loss making companies, the government should have a plan to get out of them as soon as possible. Uh, as far as the first part, your primary market is concerned, I think, you know, appetite, we always talking about the lack of appetite or, you know, the concerns about appetite. I've always found, you know, in my 25 years that in case the offering is good and the price is right, the combination and the general mood is upbeat. And appetite is not an issue because we are looking at 2000 plus FIs, we are looking at domestic institutions, we are looking at a huge record industry there. I think uh, put all of this together, we are still talking of 40, 50, 60, 70, 000, which is small, some of the government, look at the kinds of IPOs that China has floated and raised money even on the last two, three, four years. I think appetite exists, and my suggestion has been that for the industries which are already listed, uh, and there you have to have a dilution to reach 25% of the shareholders. I think the government should announce all retail policy. If, you know, we continue to move on about the lack of retail investment in the market. We should offer a great opportunity, give them at a discount to the market price. Retail will just fall in line. You will have millions of new investors coming to the market. There is always this concern: why, why should there be a discount for the retail? You know, government should maximize revenue. I mean, there are multiple objectives of divestment. One is maximization of revenue, but at the same time, we also pay, right. want to look at and larger capital markets. We want more investors to come in and I think the best way to get many small investors into the market for the first time is through a PSU stock. So I think uh, we should not look at institutional sales and there is no, this is public wealth going back to the public. So some discount is offered, there are no questions are, there is no inquiry there and I think we should seriously look at using investment of listed stocks as a great opportunity to increase the retail investor base. Right. Okay. So we'll we'll I'll come to that discount bit in a moment, uh, Mr. Vyas. I don't know if you can hear me. Are, are you able to hear me? Uh, we couldn't reach you in the previous time I tried. Mr. Vyas. 
Okay, I think we are still having a problem with uh, Mr. Vas. Uh, Subir, let me come back to you. Now, you know, there are examples like Air India, which are clearly, you know, uh, taking away a lot of taxpayers' money on one end, and on the other hand, you have uh, all, let's, I mean, in terms of strategy for disinvestment or uh, privatization, uh, uh, you know, you'll have all the relatively better off PSUs, which uh, obviously are much more attractive to the market at that point. What should the balance be from a strategic point of view? and from a, let's say, a political management point of view? Well, I think uh, you, you cannot, uh, you know, strip the, uh, the political angle out of this equation. You, you just cannot. I mean, whether you're dealing with uh, companies like Air India or the banks, because uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the recapitalization of banks for the next five years under the Basel III requirements, the new norms, uh, consolidation, uh, it may not be so much uh, disinvestment, but consolidation mm -hmm. itself is going to oh, cause a certain amount of political uh, stress because unions are going to oppose it. Uh, so there is a larger political uh, management challenge, I think, to address uh, both in terms of the, uh, the PSU uh, uh, genre and in specifically the banks, although the challenges may emerge from different uh, from from different sources, uh, but uh, the issue is, you know, if you want to keep the current employees in some fashion, uh, you know, or protect them from the consequences of uh, of uh, privatization, essentially it means assuming the salary and uh, pension liability, guaranteeing them that their financial lifetime financial benefits will not be impacted. I think that is the sort of political uh, offer that needs to be put on the table. Uh, now, can you do that? Can you afford to do that? Uh, and if you, uh, what is the best way in which that can be achieved? I think is the question that the strategy needs to address. Uh, how are you going to guarantee this? If you can't do it, uh, are you going to come? Okay, uh, Mr. Vyas, I was, uh, uh, have you, I don't know if we've got you back there. Uh, we seem to be having a little bit of a problem. So uh, my question really to you is, you know, where the rubber meets the road in terms of uh, improving the health of some of these uh, public sector or state sector enterprises before you even take them public or before you uh, make them attractive for investors, what, what's the kind of challenge that uh, you've seen, particularly in the context of Gujarat, where you've brought companies to profitability and uh, maybe the lessons that can be taken from that at the, at the more central level? Uh, well, going having seen these uh, uh, experiments uh, quite closely, I would say to begin with, the government of Gujarat followed a strategy that earlier these tight licensing days, those uh, items which were either to reserve for the public sector or the state sector, were picked up for um, um, implementation and the licenses were applied for. And GSFCB, GNFC or Gujarat Alkalis, they became a public limited company which came out with the public issue right from day one. And that, that's, that's how they were implemented and since then they have been a listed public limited company with government maintaining a, a comfortable and controlling state and controlling the board as well as the controlling day to day administration through the managing director appointed by the government. This is the model that the government of Gujarat followed as far as the uh, mm, uh, companies which you mentioned earlier are concerned. <laughs> so what's the, cha I mean, okay, so that's, let's say these are companies obviously, I mean, had a market potential, whether it's fertilizer or alkalis or electricity and so on. I mean, though not all electricity boards have been doing well. Uh, what about companies which have not been doing well and where perhaps, uh, let's say there's been more resistance from unions and employees and so on? Well, there were companies like Gujarat Tractors Limited, Polymer Corporation of Gujarat, quite a few of them, including Gujarat, uh, the Gujarat, this Gujarat Machine Tools, which government of Gujarat has successfully offloaded and they have been either uh, uh, handed over to some private sector entrepreneur or uh, they have been uh, closed or merged. For example, there was a unit called Girnar Scooters, which, which produced uh, 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 scooters uh, uh, during uh, mid-70s. It didn't do well. Ultimately, it was merged with Gujarat Navda fertilizers. And then later on, even that was not found viable, it was given up. Hindustan tractors at Baroda, similarly, which was known as Gujarat tractors, was closed down. Uh, Gujarat machine tools at Bhavnagar, similarly, was closed down. 
uh, Polymer Corporation of Gujarat also was closed down. So government of Gujarat has followed a policy of uh, beyond a point, not tolerating this kind of indefinite sickness as far as the public sector or state sector units are concerned. And either merging them with the state sector profit making units or uh, closing them down uh, with successful negotiations with the employees of the concerned uh, corporation or the concerned company. So, Mr. Vyas, what's the single biggest or single uh, one or two biggest roadblocks that this approach could face and how did, let's say, Gujarat surmount them? Well, I think the first roadblock going it faces is the transparency, which is always questioned. I think one of the things that has plagued the disinvestment in the central public sector is always some controversy or the other that has dodged it and the issues regarding transparency and even a person um, uh, like Mr. Shauri who could not have been, I think, as far as his integrity is concerned, uh, question, but even he was brought into the controversy. So this is one thing that uh, matters a lot, the transparency with which you decide the disinvestment policies and then offload the assets. So if that is possible to be done or if there is reasonable uh, openness in doing it, I think other issues are subordinate. You can successfully negotiate with the employees and they are also willing to talk sense because they are ultimately concerned about their own employment and their own well-being and uh, resettlement. So I think if you can do this, ultimately you are able to um, uh, free the um, money which are locked up in these kind of assets and use them for some uh, better uh, alternatives. And I think this is what government of Gujarat has successfully done over a period of years. Right. Uh, so, uh, Subir, how do you read that? You know, the, the whole, uh, 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 you know, an atmosphere of transparency in which the transaction is done, uh, which itself is very tricky because I'm, I'm assuming at a central level, the scrutiny is far greater. Uh, there is political, uh, you know, there is a political microscope on every uh, divestment or disinvestment that will take place. The people uh, are, as in the case of uh, Arun Shori, will be themselves under scrutiny. So, how does one manage this uh, or could this be managed more effectively this time round? Well, I think you, you have to learn from the uh, experience of the past and clearly uh, any process that is perceived to be opaque or you know not even handed that benefits are flowing unfairly to some individuals is really going to be questioned and is, is going to be that much more difficult to manage the political fallout of it. Uh, and I don't think we should underestimate the political fallout. I think that's something that is going to be there and needs to be managed. But I think the way to do it, and we, we saw this to some extent in the uh, previous episodes, uh, is to make sure that everybody understands uh, what the valuation methods are. Let there be some sort of a debate on uh, how these assets are to be valued, whatever category of assets you might have. Uh, there may be multiple ways uh, to value assets. They will arrive at some range, you know, an upper bound and lower bound, and you find a middle ground. And this is, I think, it's a practical and relatively transparent way to, to do this because you're not favoring uh, any particular stakeholder and you're not perceived to be favoring any particular stakeholder right. if you value them uh, multiple ways in, in, in different ways. Right. So and. Uh, you have at some sort of middle ground there to decide how uh, you know how, what is the price at which the transaction is going to actually take place. Right. So there are two aspects to this. We're not, I think, getting into the second aspect, which is the perception of transparency in how the funds are used. What what are the funds going to be used for? Are they going to be just pulled into the general uh, budget, or the general the consolidated fund, and be used as like any other government resources, any other public resources, or are they going to be dedicated to some very clearly identified development activity. And I think that's a second uh, side, a second dimension to the issue, which actually I think will help uh, significantly in the, in managing the political, uh, the politics of the process. But that's not an issue we're discussing today. We're talking about the process of uh, selling assets and realizing the value. Right. And in, in the context of the union budget, of course, uh, on uh, on July 10th, uh, Mr. Haldeh, let me come to you. So we've uh, picked out two issues from a strategic point of view. You know, so one is clearly the broader transparency that goes into it. And secondly, there is the specific transparency, which is to do with uh, valuation and then potentially the utilization of the proceeds. Uh, how would you see it from a market point of view? I mean, does, does this matter at all where the money is going? How is it going? Or is it something that uh, should be kept in mind too? So again, you see, as far as <clears throat> as far as divestment uh, proceeds are concerned of the district stocks, that can go to the CFI, and then can be used for development projects. I don't think we need to earmark 
specific projects as far as business stocks are concerned. But get to strategic sales, especially of loss making assets. I, I think the, the transparency is very, very critical. Number one. Number two, the valuation has to be put up in public domain. And then you have an auction process which is transparent, where there is no one on one negotiation. It's a transparent process. And anybody, anybody you know, who qualifies for a technical bid is allowed to participate in that bid. Once you allow that, then you, the important thing is, you know, employees is going to be always a major concern. And my suggestion has been that the proceeds of such strategic assets should actually be first used for employee compensation. And whatever is left over, to tell you for whatever projects you want to set up. Because employees, in case they become an impediment, first of all, employees may be absorbed by the private buyers. If they are not absorbed by the private buyers, then a specific, uh, you know, um, uh, Funds could be allocated for the benefit of the employees because uh, you are going to close down the units and it's going to lead to a lot of political debate also. So I think the funds should be first year for employees and uh, I have, as long as you have a transparent process where uh, bidding is open to one and all who qualifies technically and then uh, it's the public process, it's a process on the website, it's not across the table. I think it will not draw any kind of uh, uh, debate and because the problem is that in case you either set up RFP in a manner where only one company or two companies are able to qualify. You put one of those, two of those conditions and make it okay. Or you have technical uh, bids which are, uh, you know, uh, subject to some negotiations. I think if we can get rid of all those and make the whole process very transparent, then uh, uh, we should get down to selling. You know, Mr. Jaran very rightly mentioned, why should the government continue to bleed on bidding assets? I mean, we have to put a stop. Get rid of those assets, either merge them or get rid of them, so that at least there are no fresh flows into those assets. And the government does not have to bleed from them. So I, I Sell wish out it was those as, But I, I don't know, I, I wish it was as easy as you, uh, as easier said than done, as they say. Uh, let me come back to Mr. Vyas. Uh, what about utilization of proceeds, uh, Mr. Vyas? Was that uh, an issue that you grappled with uh, in Gujarat? Well, I think utilization of the proceeds are concerned, it ultimately goes to the general funds of the government. Okay. As far as the government dues are concerned. Uh, if at all there are any statutory liabilities, uh, they go towards payment of these dues also like locked up salaries or PF dues or whatever are the defaulting liabilities. Uh, bearing that, I think it is entirely up to the government because ultimately it is their investment that they are taking it back. So ultimately it goes to the, and, and as you are aware, going budgetary process of the government doesn't permit anything that comes to the government go out of it unless appropriate budgetary provisions are made. Uh, unless you create a separate account in the government that the, the, as the proceeds will go there and then it, that uh, uh, separately will be planned. Ultimately it goes to the consolidated funds and they are uh, used for whatever priorities are assigned through the budget to the um, uh, purpose for which they are assigned. Right. Uh, Subir, let me come back to you. You know, the reason we are going into this whole round of disinvestment, at least optically, seems to be the fact that we need to raise money. Uh, now, does that in some ways contradict with what could be or should be the larger purpose of disinvestment or divestment, which is to make enterprises more efficient, which is to make the economic or the play in the economy far more efficient? No, I think... Uh it's perfectly legitimate to look at disinvestment as a way of raising money. I think the government has to look at its balance sheet, look at what is the appropriate set of assets that it has to own in order to achieve its larger welfare development uh, objectives. And if there is a set of assets which it does not need to own, then it's perfectly legitimate to say, look, let's let's you know get rid of these and let uh, if, if let them find their value in the market. As I said at the beginning, some of these will find great value as going concerns. Some of them will find great value as uh, real estate or other things. But that is something that the process must uh, decide. Not it, It's not a decision that can be taken by the by the policymaker or not, not a judgment that can be made by the policymaker. Let the best value be found by whoever is willing to pay it. Uh, now, once you have that, uh, this fits into the larger uh, uh, strategic picture that I was saying. Is what, what are the assets that the government should legitimately own? Uh, should it be? Should it own uh, companies that uh, make automobiles? Should it own companies that make scooters? Should it own companies that uh, provide, uh, you know, aviation services? Or should it own you know, power plants or hospitals or, or uh, water supply or, or things like that? 
I think that's a fundamental judgment, a fundamental reorientation. And we have to keep in mind that the evolution of the of the uh, public sector enterprise cohort, the body, has been very mixed. You know, there was the industrial policy uh, uh, orientation in the 50s, but after that, there was a whole spate of nationalizations. I mean, from what I understand, I may be wrong in this, but I heard that the most valuable company in the in the public sector fold is the National Textile Corporation uh, because of the prime land that uh, the mills that it uh, took over or the mills that were taken over and folded into the NTC because the land that they own, they're not producing any cloth or anything of any significance, but they own enormous amounts of very, very valuable land in, in cities like Mumbai. Now, if that is the case, you know, should the government be sitting on these assets? And, you know, what is the social value that is being generated from the ownership of the assets? I think that's a very fundamental question that has to drive the disinvestment process. I don't think we should be worried about whether it's going to make the companies more efficient because many of these companies actually don't deserve to be around, don't deserve to be in existence. Right. Let's not worry about that. Let's look at the best way to get right. the government the most amount of money it can for the assets that it is about to sell. Right. Okay. Uh, we sort of, as we conclude, uh, let me come back to you, Mr. Haldia. So, you know, the one lesson from the past, and we've obviously uh, attempted disinvestment and succeeded to some extent in many cases, uh, in, and including privatization as well. The one lesson you feel from a, a market and an appetite point of view that, uh, or a mistake we should not make, and the one thing that we could do differently this time, uh, as uh, particularly as would be articulated in the budget. I think uh, the Sebi has already set the ball rolling by saying that uh, TSU should go for a 25% public share only. Uh, as far as appetite is concerned, I think uh, the kind of companies that we are looking at being available, all the, the prices are already discounted by the facts of, you know, there is a, there's a government company, there could be ministerial interference, etc., etc. I think all those factors are already discounted in the price. The important thing is for uh, you know, I've been suggesting that for listed stocks, in case you want to do institutional sales and not just retail, which is what I've been advocating, then the better result would not be to do an OFS or an FPO where you're competing with your own market price and therefore we've seen these prices being beaten badly. I think we should take the market by surprise uh, just a day before uh, you want to and do an auction, a closed auction, where there could be institutional investors who are willing to pay a price even higher than the market price because they are acquiring a key asset on a long-term basis. The, the, we have seen, is, you know, in the last couple of years, we have seen that FPOs or offers for sale are, are, are announced almost a month to two months. The market start beating the price. The government is then forced to price it according to the current market price, and then the prices rises after the OFS has been done. So I think the case the government wants to maximize its uh, revenues through uh, institutional sales, then we should go through a closed auction method. And and your thing, your uh, advice on the primary market is you were saying a fifteen percent discount. Is that did I hear that right? Yes, uh, or go one hundred percent retail. Uh, you know, people talk about depth of the retail market. I just want to give an example, not in terms of returns to the investors, but in terms of the appetite that the retail investor has. Reliance Power came out with an IPO five years ago. Forty nine thousand nine hundred crores was put in by retail. When I say retail, people applying for one lakh rupees and less, and this was not. Uh, uh, you know, this is not a small amount, 50,000 crores in just one IPO. I think retail investors have been out of equity for a long time. They are looking at opportunities. PSU will offer a good opportunity, give them a discount to the market price, money will come. And the objective of this investment, which is not only to raise money for the government, but also to increase transparency and finally to increase the depth of the capital market, I think all these three objectives can be met by, uh, by doing a slightly more focused and, uh, you know, a different kind of uh, strategy than what we have followed in the last uh, four or five years. Right. Okay. So uh, 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 do an auction ahead of the offer. Do not give a give a gap like uh, it was there before. Uh, and of course, make it interesting for retail. They're there because they've uh, at a good price with good uh, supply. They're going to come out there in droves. Okay. Uh, 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 Subir, your uh, quick sort of uh, lesson from the past that we should uh, either heed or not heed, and what would what could we do differently this time? Well, I think the, the lesson, the main lesson that we should not heed or, or should, not even a lesson, I think it's a premise. We should not be looking at this as a process by which we want to make public enterprises more efficient. I don't, I think that is, that has been the spoiler in this whole assessment. We should be looking at it as a process by which the government rebalances its asset portfolio for the public good or to, to, be, to be consistent with 
development and welfare objectives of the country. Uh, and let's work from that. Let's not worry about this efficiency business. I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. Let's just realize the maximum value we can and put it to good use. That's the, that's the second dimension. Not No point in selling off these assets if you're not going to put the realizations to good use. Uh, so those are two dimensions I think we have to uh, look at in sync. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vyas, uh, last word. Your uh, lesson, one lesson from the past and one thing that we could do differently perhaps uh, if we were to go ahead with uh, accelerated disinvestment or divestment now. Well, going since this entire discussion pertains to the budget, one lesson from the past which emerges loud and clear is that so far, whatever were the estimates, they have been highly um, uh, unsuccessful in even realizing 50% of the estimates that they placed in the budget of this investment targets uh, and assume possible revenue because of that. So I think budget makers must approach this with a, not only a pinch of salt but handful of salt while they make their targets. That why in past these targets were not realized and what is that now that they are going to do that the targets which they are fixing up in the budget estimates are going to be realized. I think ultimately the final success of this entire exercise would depend upon how best and how fast you are going to achieve the targets which are kept for the budget. And unfortunately so far the record of this investment is not that very promising or not that very healthy. Right, uh, Mr. Vyas, uh, thank you for that. Well, so uh, very important uh, lessons and takeaways from here. Transparency, focus on raising uh, uh, value from uh, what is the, uh, embedded within these enterprises. Don't focus on making them better or more efficient. We've in some senses crossed that bridge. Once, the, uh, once we've decided to go ahead, then manage the offer process more efficiently. There are some clear lessons there. Obviously, make it attractive to retail investors. Not only will they come in, but also that will help revive the markets, which is another issue that's been uh, hanging for a while. And of course, uh, set careful, uh, uh, careful targets so that uh, you don't over, uh, overstretch and then under deliver on this. And that's, uh, that's the lesson as we go ahead into the union budget for particularly from a divestment, disinvestment, perhaps leading to privatization in some cases. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on this India Hangout special with Business Standard. We are going to be back soon.